when Django died, his name became like a legend amongst all guitar players in the music business, and it's like his name suddenly started appearing in huge letters on the records with Stefan Grappelli as a kind of like condition, contract condition in the small print. And Stefan got really pissed off about that. So I don't think there was any real, you know, grievance with Django as a person. It was just like how people like distorted things after Django died. Stefan was a major sound in that hot club just as much as Django was and was never credited enough for that. Stefan couldn't help but feel that he, by surviving his partner, was somehow being written off. Sometimes he was even spoken of in the past tense, as though it was all over now. Stefan went on playing and recording right through the 60s, but even by 1966, he's sounding, for him anyway, weary. So when he was offered a residency at the Paris Hilton, leading the dancing and dining band in the club there, he took it. He was to spend five years there. Other professional musicians were surprised, thought it beneath him, people eating and talking rather than just listening, but Stefan himself thought it was a good proposition as a job. Maybe he was tired of living out of a suitcase. And besides, he was always happiest when he was playing, when he was making music for an audience no matter where. Certainly the job had its compensations. John Etheridge. I say, Stefan, you played for six years in the Hilton restaurant in Paris. What was that like? You know, he said, oh, it was very nice. I have my suite in the top of the hotel. I come down. I play, and every time somebody wanted new arch, they had to pay 50 francs. <laughs> Right. Meanwhile, all the visiting American musicians came into the Hilton after concerts, maybe even stayed there. Basie, Errol Garner, Stan Getz, Dizzy Gillespie. And although nominally Stefan spent five years there, he often employed a substitute and left for recording sessions and other more lucrative performances. He used to give the impression of himself as a kind of jobbing player. But as soon as he played, and, and this, you see, if people didn't listen enough, they'd go, oh, Stefan will play you. Do you so much of his life spent as a jobbing move. But, but every time he played, and there are re records all the way through where the just most magnificent violin playing, beautiful. I mean, it's untouchable. And yet, at the same time, this guy was supposedly some sort of, you know, restaurant hack. And then his fortunes began to change. Sasha Distel was about to open at the London Palladium. My agent, uh, Michael Grade, at the time, calls me and says that we were looking for people to be around me in the, in the show. I uh, said, well, uh, whatever happened to Stefan Grappelli? Is he still alive? I said, yeah, not only is he alive, but I know where he's playing. And, and he was just there lost with three musicians. And he would play when the other musicians were resting. He would play piano, which he played wonderful in an Art Tatum style. He would play the piano to make a little bit more money. So I went to see him. I said, would you like to come with me at the London Palladium for a season and a tour? And he said, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, I like it very much here, but I'm not sure that the manager here, you know, he likes me very much. I'm not sure that he'll let me go. So, well, let me talk to him. So I went to talk to the manager. And the manager said, well, all right, I'll, I'll let Stefan do it. But the one condition, you, you come and, and perform here for New Year's Eve. So I called Michael Gray. I said, are you sure you want a seven Capelli in the show? He said, yeah, I think it'd be good. You hear you know, such a nostalgia from the war about it. So I brought... Stefan back to London, with me, to London Palladium, and that was the beginning of his second career. After that, pianist Alan Clare began to arrange trio concerts for him in London, trying to convince him of his own greatness. Clare was not wrong. People began to queue up to hear him. In December 1971, he was invited to take part in Michael Parkinson's television show and to play on the show with Menuhin. Both men agreed. Stefan was worried about not being properly trained. But in fact, it was Menuhin who had more reason to be nervous. Stefan was a master of improvisation. Menuhin was not. And he went to meet uh, Menuhin. And we waited in the BBC bar. You were allowed to do it in those days. And he came in about four hours later. His face wreathed in smiles, Stefan. And he walked towards and I said, how was it? How was it? He said, tell me. He said, four bars into Lady Be Good, who's the maestro? The show was a huge success. Here you had two men who represented the extremes of music, if you like. One, the jazz improviser, the other, this wonderful maestro, and that's what he was, of the, of the classical violin. And yet what became apparent was the musical unity between the two and then this wonderful admiration that they had for each other. I mean, when you listen to the records now, gimmick is, is not the word, but they don't really hold up. You had to be there to see it to appreciate that kind of bonding. It was, a, it was a lovely and moving occasion. I'm delighted that we played some part in bringing those two men together.
Stefan was almost 64 and a whole new beginning seemed on the cards. Soon he was recording with Menuhin and about this time too he met Nigel Kennedy, then a student who had discovered the Hot Club recordings and a passionate enthusiasm for jazz many years before. When I was first playing with Stefan it was like a dream come true. It was just a fantastic experience to actually have someone like Stefan say that he wanted me to play with his band, you know, after the first time when I got up there and almost bludgeoned my way into his band when, as a kind of joke, he was asking all the Menuhin school snotty brats if they wanted to join in, because he knew they wouldn't. But I had my fiddle ready and jumped up there, and the fact that he wanted me to come back again and do more was a real kind of encouragement to me. And I think to him, he was encouraged because he saw some young guy, like, coming and playing exactly the same idiom as what he was doing, and so he was pleased that someone of a younger generation was interested and could do it. I was a bit more of a rougher player, which actually went quite well with his style, because he was smooth and I was like, a bit more of a heathen. Stefan's music at this time is truly astonishing. Mature in the fullest and best sense of the word, confident, heartfelt and masterly. He'd been wonderful before, but now his time had really come. The complete public recognition that had escaped him for so long was just around the corner. He'd begun to work with the guitarist Diz Disley. The pair had met briefly in 1957 and then again in 1964. Diz had the imagination to realise just how much audiences liked hearing Stefan playing with guitarists. In 1973, he persuaded him to play at the Cambridge Folk Festival. He'd fixed up two weeks' work with the festival in the middle. The early concerts went very well but nothing could have prepared them for the festival itself. Stefan, at 65, thought he was much too old to play for an audience of 25,000 young people. He was afraid that they wouldn't know who he was, and it was true, they didn't. The band went on to be confronted by a sea of curious faces. There was to be no nostalgia here. They went straight into Sweet Georgia Brown, and as Denny Wright said, the roof fell in. Here's Stefan. You have such ovation, I nearly cry. I couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, uh, 10,000 people screaming at their head off. They uh, um, look at me and say, you see? Huh? It's not too bad. Maybe he just needed a few people to tell him he was great again. And like um, a young audience, there was nothing that Stefan liked more than playing to a young audience. He was so pleased when he found himself in front of a group of young people and that they digged his music like. Stefan, said one reviewer ecstatically, poured out happiness as though it was going out of style. And the audience couldn't help but respond. From that time on, Stefan was acclaimed as something magical, an eccentric maestro who took pleasure in giving pleasure and whose playing spoke of effortless genius. When Diz Disley broke his wrist in 1979, I got a phone call to join Stefan on a series of concerts in France and Belgium. For me, it was like a dream come true, having been raised on the music of Django and Stefan. We collaborated for 11 years, and I watched Stefan in amazement as he just got better and better. He carried on touring and recording for many years and died in 1997 in a Paris clinic after an operation. He was just a few weeks short of his 90th birthday. In music, he had this absolute sense of freedom, which when you're around is incredibly relaxing. You feel that everything is so easy. Everything just comes totally naturally. Everything is organic. Everything, one thing flows from another and then everything's done and then everything is in its place. There was something amazing about the quality of Stefan's playing, which was a lesson I learned for the rest of my life, is that you can make top quality, absolutely amazing music and have a great time doing it. He was a very talented, hugely likeable, very enjoyable man. He meant music as it should be. I'm Martin Taylor, and you've been listening to The Hot Club 2, written by Catherine Tchaikowska and produced by Anthony Cherry. <laughs>